Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And before I start the interview with our great guest, I want to share something personal. Today marks the seventh year anniversary of my dad's passing. And it's kind of a bittersweet day for me because not only did I lose my dad that day, but it's been about seven years since I've spoken to two of my siblings. I know from your emails that a lot of people are suffering from grief and also are suffering due to things that happen with relationships around the times of death. What I want to share is that there's nothing wrong with my siblings. They're great people. And without dad passing the way he did, and without all the things happening with the relationships with my siblings, I would have never taken the time to research the afterlife. I would have never taken the time to research grief and find out that perfectly good human beings, uh, we kind of lose our minds when we're grieving. We really do on, on a chemical level, lose part of our memory, which is part of the reason for the miscommunications and fighting and, and all those things. And I would have never started this radio show, which has impacted the lives of thousands of people. Uh, if you were to receive some of the emails I get, there have been people that have helped through grief and many people that have chosen not to commit suicide because of these episodes. And if I, Sandra Champlain, take my own advice that we don't die, that life is for a purpose. I do believe in my heart, and I have to remind myself of this, that perhaps I signed up for this mission that I'm on. My siblings also signed up to help. And if we had close relationships right now, I don't think I'd be spending the time researching the afterlife and sharing this. And I, I do trust that our greatest growth of our soul comes through our suffering. And I also trust with all of my heart that this will all work out in the end. And there is no end. So <laughs> you know what I'm getting at, though. So if you're someone who is dealing with um, the stress and the pain of grief right now, it hurts. It does. And it's like an open wound. But if we look back upon our past and see some of those really challenging times, we can say, but look, it needed to be that way for me to be where I am right now. So again, I love my siblings. I know this will all work out. And I love you, the listener, and I thank you for your time. But know that I do believe we don't die. I do believe my dad is a champion helping me here from this, from his side in the hereafter. Um, and today I just want to really celebrate the life and dedicate this episode to my dad, John Champlain. So without further ado, let's get on to the show. Um, it, and it's a perfect time to talk about connecting with those in the loved ones because uh, connecting with those in the hereafter, because our guest today is going to talk about something called the soul phone. And you might remember this man's name. It's Dr. Mark Pitstick, who I had the privilege to interview on episode 103 of this show a year ago, which is awesome. And I'm also going to share the stage with him at the upcoming Afterlife Research and Education Symposium. And I invite you to that. It's in September 2017 in Scottsdale, Arizona. And there are a few days left to get in on the discount registration. So if you're interested, go to Afterlife Studies dot org to register. So a little bit about our guest. Mark is the director and one of the co-founders of the Soul Phone Foundation can be found at soulphone.org. He has over 40 years experience in training in hospitals, pastoral counseling settings, mental health centers, and private practice. Dr. Pitstick is the author of three books, including Soul Proof, Compelling Evidence That No One Really Dies, and is the creator of the fantastic documentary film about the afterlife called Soul Proof. Now, what does this man know about the soul phone? Here we go. Dr. Mark Pitstick, welcome back to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you very much, Sandra. Pleasure to be here. Oh, pleasure to have you. And I know you said before the we started recording that my dad is smiling right now. Yes, uh, and that's one of the many benefits of, as you know, of knowing that no one really dies is that 
our, quote, departed loved ones are still very near, cheering us on, so proud of us. We can continue the, that relationship. That's really special. That's really special. Now, Mark, some of our guests have, our, some of our listeners have not heard your prior interview. So could you just let us know a little bit about uh, what made you explore the topic of the afterlife and why you want to share, so much, share it with others so much? Sure. Uh, first of all, a little disclaimer, though. I don't claim to know all the answers or the only answers. I'm not holding that out. Okay. And also what I uh, believe uh, changes from year to year. And finally, some of what I'll be saying is based on scientific and clinical studies, uh, but some of it is based on empirical st- uh, information that is based on firsthand experience of myself and others and my best sense or understanding of things. So I just like to make that clear. Yep. Well, <clears throat> to answer your question, there is a um, there is some evidence that I didn't totally forget uh, where I came from when I came to Earth. When I was uh, six years old, my parents were showing me a beautiful sunset, and I told them it reminded me of God. And they only told me that 20 years later when I was in theology school. Now, I was raised in a Lutheran church. It was always God the Father this and God Father that. So there is really no way I would associate a beautiful sunset with the divine unless, indeed, I had some prior recollection. And then uh, over the years, different psychics, mediums, people could see energy and auras told me that, uh, you know, the same kind of thing, that I didn't totally develop spiritual amnesia. So... That kind of set the stage, and so growing up, I, you know, I, I, it was almost like I had to learn how to be a good Earthling. When I read the book in college, Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Ludlum, I thought, yeah, well, that's what I felt like. Uh, and so I um, took to meditation and yoga as soon as I learned about it early in college and have been doing it ever since, 45-some years. Um, <clears throat> but my... My awakening uh, and wanting to serve and, and teach about this really accelerated when I was around 19 working in hospitals, part-time as a respiratory therapist. And every shift was around some one or more people who died. And seeing that, including little children, mm-hmm. just drove me to my knees because my uh, I hadn't been around anything like that. And my uh, religious upbringing, you know, God is all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful. Well, if that's the case, why is all this going on on a daily basis in every city in the world? So <clears throat> that launched in a period of agnosticism, and I set about finding out for myself what's what's the deal. You know, is there really an afterlife, or can we just not um, endure the thought of nothingness? And after 20 years of reading every book and going to every workshop, et cetera, uh, found that it had boxes of information that clearly showed that uh, we're forever beings. And then that's what I put together for the book, Soul Proof, and the documentary, and so on. So these days, I'm working a lot with bereaved parents and also um, those who have had a loved one die by suicide, because I find those to be the, the two toughest groups. I mean, if I can get through to them, I can get through to anybody. Yes. And sharing with them that life is just so wonderfully set up and and this is such a meaningful safe and magnificent adventure we're having on earth right now it is an adventure isn't it with the ups and the downs and the peaks and the valleys Mm -hmm. so how do we continue with this now we're talking about the soul phone today and uh and i do encourage people to go back to listen to episode 103 because there's so much more mark has to share about his past and his findings um but our topic today is the soul phone and you started well you start because what is a soul phone first of all well it's the uh, it's a name uh, for a series of devices actually and let's mm-hmm. let's walk through those okay um, <clears throat> so first of all this has to do with the research of dr. Gary Schwartz University of Arizona at the what's called the laboratory for advancements in consciousness and health so for those of you um, of the listeners who don't know about dr. Schwartz he's a former Yale and Harvard professor he's 74 years old Um one of the top geniuses I've ever met in my life. And he's been at the University of Arizona for 20 years. He started first with investigating mediums 
because he had an interest in afterlife. Is it really an afterlife or not? How can we prove that? And thought that if he could validate that certain mediums indeed have a verifiable uh, verifiable ability to communicate with those, quote, on the other side, then that's a pretty good indication that there's more to life than meets the eye. Uh, so he investigated uh, all the top names uh, people had ever heard of, John Edward, George Anderson, Suzanne Northrup, et cetera, and then more contemporary ones like Suzanne Giesman and Susan, Suzanne Wilson. And uh, so he's found about 30 mediums who – uh, he calls medium rock stars. They have about a 95% hit rate. And <clears throat> under research um, conditions, double, even triple blind um, conditions, has shown that these people truly can communicate with those who have passed on. And by the way, this research has been replicated at three other universities and an institute. So it, it's it's well established. It's been written up peer-reviewed journals, uh, you know, it's it's scientifically proved. Mm -hmm. Well, next he turned his attention to then, okay, so if, um, if those who have passed on are alive and well, how can we communicate with them? And so about 10 years ago, he started research on spirit communication technologies. And by the way, as a side note, in, in the course of working together, and we have for about eight months now, uh, we discovered that Alexander Graham Bell, uh, Mark Honey, who invented the, the radio, and Edison all were working on devices to, to do the same thing. Very, uh, very years, cool. You know, very yeah. cool. Yes. Yeah. But, of course, the technology was limited back then. Mm -hmm. And we're also told by top mediums that the uh, morphic field, uh, the energy surrounding the Earth was too dense then to allow – intercommunication between us and quote spirit world uh, but now it, it will support that so <clears throat> dr schwartz um, again working university of arizona has top top equipment some of the devices are so sensitive for example there is one that measures uh, any uh, attenuation any decrease in a laser light beam well, this instrument is so sensitive, <clears throat> excuse me, in measuring light, that it also picks up vibrations. He said a car driving a mile away can subtly affect the measurements. Uh, so wow. the, it turns out that the task is to, number one, amp up the input from those in spirit, and that can be their light, their energy, or their motion, and then to dampen background noise so that we clearly can detect communications and then uh, use that to to communicate. Um, so with that background, the first um, the first device that Dr. Schwartz anticipates will be ready and he thinks in about a year with a 90 to 95 percent probability, we're calling the soul switch. okay so this is a binary indicator, a yes no. Uh, much like a, a light switch on the wall. It's on or it's off. Okay. So, for example, the the uh, light attenuation experiment I mentioned, there is a beam that passes through, and then um, for, for the control, there's just nothing that passes through this beam. And so you just see a, a baseline of nothing. Then they'll pass a plexiglass hand through this beam, and they'll oh. notice the the change on the computer that showing that that beam is being blocked. Then Rhonda, his wife, who is one of the top mediums in the world, will ask one of what we call a collaborated, hypothesized collaborating spirit, HCS, to please put their hand through a beam. <laughs> Another side note, um, before being around this work, it was my impression that those who have changed worlds we're mostly in an energetic form, mm -hmm. kind of like Casper the Friendly Ghost, uh, <laughs> you know, light, energy, but not much substance to them. And it turns out, in fact, that um, those who have passed on enjoy taking on physical form for various activities. I mean, they still enjoy sports, interacting, and can have physical lovemaking, for example. Uh, the picture is emerging, <clears throat> but especially when... Um, getting in touch with those of us on Earth 
they can take on a physical form. Uh, Albert Einstein is one of the, uh, quote, deceased luminaries who's communicating through these mediums. And he said, we are historical systems of energy and information, and we tend to replicate our most recent physical manifestation in certain conditions. Uh, that's not an exact quote, but that's paraphrasing. I'm like, okay, well, that sounds like Albert Einstein. <laughs> how, so, did, how did he come through to say that it's him participating through, in this? Through the mediums. Okay. Yeah. So these spirits then are passing their hand through this light beam, and that shows not as strongly as the plexiglass hand because, you know, they're more etheric, but it shows a definite and statistically significant attenuation, decrease in the light beam. And these studies have been uh, duplicated a number of times to the point of we have what's called proof of concept studies. And the next stage then, and it's fully funded, is to produce a reliably functioning device that will allow us to get yes, no answers from those on the other side. Okay. The At that point, um, the plan is because Gary has lots of contacts, including Hollywood producers and so on. Uh, and right now, in fact, there's an executive producer of TV shows for 30 years. His most recent project was America's Most Wanted. Uh, he is pitching an eight-part documentary series on the cell phone, and his agent thinks that it will be an easy sell, especially after Netflix just did the uh, the movie with Robert Redford, The Discovery. Yes. So, there's so much in uh, interest in this topic. So that, of course, is going to help this go viral, and especially after we have a yes-no indicator. So Gary is uh, designing what we call 20 questions that will allow us to quickly, A, confirm that the visiting spirit is who they say they are, and then B, allow some rudimentary communication. Now, after the soul switch is perfected, and again, expected in about a year, then what is uh, the next step is to assemble a um, about 39 of these keys, which is basically what a keyboard is. And so, for example, if you push an L on your keyboard, that's a yes for the L and a no for everything else. So that in about two years, we expect to have a soul keyboard to allow soul texting. And that then will allow much more rapid and extensive communication, not only with our, quote, departed loved ones, but also with these deceased luminaries, uh, Tesla, Planck, Edison, Einstein, and so on, who are geniuses and very um, – special people while on earth and they still have that vibrant energy on the other side and want to help those of us on earth solve our biggest problems wow, mark i i know to my core this is all possible i i can't help but think of um you know, hearing stories from years ago when the population on the earth uh, thought the earth was flat, right? And then it, it took mm -hmm. somebody, it took, I think it was Galileo circumnavigating the globe, that it is round. And then I just recently uh, listened to the audio book on the Wright brothers. And mm -hmm. back at the turn of the century, um, well over a hundred years ago, are these two brothers that had a dream and believed it's possible. And to listen to this audiobook and realize how many people thought they were crazy and i mean even the government even after they created the the airplane they people wouldn't even listen to them they thought they were crazy and now you know today i'm getting on a flight to london right <laughs> and thinking nothing of it you know whereas mm -hmm. over a hundred years ago like it, it couldn't be possible. So I'm looking at the soul phone as something like it, it might be easy for our skeptical minds to say, yeah, right. You know, but all it takes is a dream. And it's actually more than that because uh, you folks have been working on it a long time to make this a reality. Yeah, it's interesting you use the Wright Brothers analogy because that's exactly what we consider we're at right now, a Wright Brothers moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were only five people observing that first flight which lasted 12 seconds, Right. and you're right, most people on the planet thought it was impossible, but those five who observed it knew it was possible, and we have many more than five on the team. So it is possible, and it's very, very likely it's going to happen soon, and um, the ramifications for that are huge. So 
after the sole text device, <clears throat> probably within about a year after that, but maybe about the same time, two years, then sole voice will be like we're talking right now. Now, of course, we don't know at this point how clear the voice will be, mm -hmm. um, but, but Dr. Uh, Schwartz expects, again, based on his foundational studies, to have that capability. And then the next stage, sole video, which will be like conferencing, Zoom, Skype, however you do it, being able to see and hear. Wow. Mark, I can't help but think back to the airplane. It, flying is now something we take for granted. It is. We just fly. Uh, we get, you know, I, I shop with Amazon. Stuff shows up to my house the next day. I don't even think about it. It's just automatic, and it's because of uh, airplane flight. What's possible years from now when the soul phone is just a regular thing? How would we be living life? First of all, it, 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 just your speculations on what it would be like after the the death of a loved one, the so-called death of a loved one. To how would how do you think we would be living, really having this technology? alive and functioning in our daily life. Yeah, it's going to change a lot of things. And, and ultimately, by the way, the, the vision is to have an application, an app to add to a smartphone, uh, because in the beginning, communica spirit communication will require what's called a soul studio. So it'll be a small room filled with all this equipment. A medium will be involved, what we call a spirit operator to get in t contact with those in spirit world and <clears throat> make sure they're available and, and comfortable with the technology. But eventually, we think that uh, it'll just be relayed by a satellite like any other app and a person will be able to use. But to answer your question, uh, it's going to change so many things, and that's part of what we're playing with right now and trying to anticipate that, address concerns, and so on. But grieving, for example, uh, what I anticipate is that people will still grieve, but it will be much lighter uh, and shorter than it is now. I interviewed uh, Wayne Dyer probably 20 years ago on a radio show I had at the time, and he's talking about self-actualized people, no-limit people, grieve so much less because they know there's really no death right. and it'll be the same way i think for the masses in the future sure you'll miss them you know you miss the physical touch and hearing their voice and all that but with those devices you'll still be able to hear their voice you just won't be able to to be hugged by them and so on so um so many so many benefits removing fear you know so many people have unconscious fears i am um, years ago i worked with a patient named maud and probably for 15 years and she was 93 and i could see over time so i was working with her with uh, holistic health care chiropractic nutrition and so on and i could see her going downhill <clears throat> so i had an intuition that i wouldn't be seeing her again and I said, Maude, you know, in case one of us is going to pass on one of these days, uh, in case I don't see you again, I just want you to know that I'll see you in another time and place, and I'll see you up there. And she all of a sudden looked really serious. Now, Maude was one of the pillars of our community, went to church twice a week. She was involved in all kinds of community groups and serving others. If you ever met an earth angel or a saint, she was one. But when I said that, uh, I'll see you up there, she said, well, I hope I go up there. She, then she looked down the ground. She said, I hope I don't end up in that other place. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, my God, if Maud fears going to hell, what, what do most people do, consciously or unconsciously? And so, of course, this research will uh, remove any fears of archaic, erroneous teachings like that. Yeah, I don't believe there's a hell myself, no, with everything that I've learned and studied our soul moves on and et cetera, and so forth. Um, I, gosh, I have so many questions. What to ask you next? Yeah. Just to, to sum up what you're saying, even about fear, you know, we, we human beings, there's, there's so much fear. And if we can realize that, you know, we are never alone, that we don't die, that we don't have to be afraid. Like failure is just an illusion. It's all growth for our soul. 
I think having the technology of a soul phone to remind us of that, you know, sometimes we have a big decision to make or if we need to have some courage, you know, it'll help remind us that, you know what, everything I'm doing right now is for growth for my soul. So I just think, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And also, Mark, I, you know, I've experienced electronic voice phenomena. I've witnessed some phenomena in, with, um, you know, all kinds of things, the physical mediumship and lights going on and off. And I know it's possible for our loved ones in the hereafter to be able to manipulate energy. So I have full faith that uh, the Soul Phone Foundation will be able to harness this and create this. Like there's no doubt in my mind. Sure. Here's another uh, potential benefit, the healing. In other words, we know the body has such restorative and healing capabilities. And in my own practice, I see it on a regular basis, people who have terminal diseases, Mm -hmm. people who have hopeless cases, and yet they come around. So that was part of the reason I became a doctor of chiropractic. Their philosophy was there are no incurable diseases, there are just incurable cases. And they say the same power and energy that created and sustains the universe also resides within each one of us. They call it innate intelligence. And so the the path to healing then is to remove those interferences so the body can heal itself. So we look at cases like Anita Moore Johnny, who's probably been on your show and, and she has so not yet. Not yet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so if listeners haven't heard her story, she wrote uh, the book Dying to Be Me. She had terminal terminal cancer, came to the hospital to die and then did die. Uh, had a near-death experience and saw very clearly that, number one, she's one with the one right now. She's part of source energy, and that's what many people who have near-death experiences realize. Mm -hmm. And two, she is in heaven now and always. In other words, we're in eternity right now, and whether that feels like heaven or hell depends on a number of factors largely under our control. So she realized, well, if I can experience heaven now, and if I'm part of God now, I might as well stay on earth. Coming back then with those deep realizations and the increased energy that accompanied that, that degree of realization, she was healed, no signs of cancer. And that's been clearly documented by pre and post studies. So I'm also excited about the the possibilities in healing when people drop fear of hell, death, um, you know, they quit blaming themselves. Mm-hmm. They realize who they are. Um, I, I think we're going to see a lot less disease and a lot better uh, healing from those that do occur. Mm. We are souls having a human experience. And so even though we live in this illusion that we have a body, I mean, I think those innate, uh, the wisdom we have within us, I mean, we are souls that are anything's possible healing is possible and just if anyone hasn't read or listened to the audiobook dying to be me by anita morjani fantastic talk about mm-hmm. fantastic wow so mark you have your team on this side with gary schwartz and all the, the others creating the soul phone is there a group of so-called deceased scientists inventors um working on the other side to make this happen Uh, there is and so we call the the team on earth and that would be um scientists who work with garrett university uh optical physicists software engineers and other scientists as well as we have a a wonderful expanding team in fact i'll be uh, having a conference call in an hour with uh three bereaved parents uh who i met through helping parents heal who are working together, Bob Sturetz, the co-founder. We have um, a business person who contacted us from the London Business School, um, uh, a, a wonderful donor who's lining up funding for all this. So the team just keeps expanding. And so uh, that's what we call the B team. Also, people who visit the website soulphone.org will see we have about a dozen um, people on our educational advisory board, Evan Alexander, Raymond Moody, Bill Guggenheim, et cetera. And then also um, about seven of the top mediums, some of whom I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. So that's the B team. <clears throat> the A team is uh, those who are in spirit. And I mentioned some of them before, Max Planck, 
the founder of quantum physics, Nikolai Tesla, Edison, Einstein, uh, Steve Jobs, you know, people you would suspect who would be interested in this sort of thing. So uh, we we don't talk about that group a lot because that's going to set off the incredulous uh, meter for some people. You know, we say it's about the technology and not about the team, but uh, there are about 20 um, quote, departed luminaries who are assisting us from the other side. And we are assured that there are actually thousands of um, those in another realm who are assisting this. Mediums like Suzanne Wilson uh, say that um, this is already a done deal. This project is already going to happen. It's already been accomplished in the etheric and the energy realm. It's just a matter of us uh, mere mortals to assemble it here. That's great. And Suzanne Wilson, she's been on the show uh, and she's going to be back on the show talking about the symposium, but she is one of those rock stars. I remember, you know, some of the guests that I interview, I like to find out, you know, they say they're a medium. Well, let me try this one out. And I had a big notebook and I literally filled five pages worth of things that came out of her mouth. Mm-hmm. And as accurate, I tell you, rock star, unbelievable and eerie. And then she had told me, and this was oh, sometime last year, that she and I were going to work together and, you know, what we're going to do. And I thought, well, how's that going to happen? Now come to find out we're both going to be on stage together on the uh, at the symposium. And I'm thinking, it's all happening, you know, really, mm-hmm. really great. Yeah, and, and she's such a loving, wonderful person. And, and there's a good example, by the way, of what you mentioned when people are going through tough times. And uh, what I'm about to tell is in her second book, uh, which she asked me to endorse, and I actually review, uh, proved it for her. Um, so she had her abilities as a child to see uh, see more of the greater reality than most of us can. And she's a fairly <clears throat> forthright person, so when she's in grade school, she would say to other kids, you know, I'm sorry, but your grandpa is going to die tomorrow. And then it would happen. Wow. And they would come back to her and say, you know, you're a witch. You made it happen. It's your fault. They called her Crazy Susie. Mm-hmm. And she said numerous times she was beat up by a gang of kids on the playground. Mm-hmm. And so you can imagine how difficult that is. However, she as a soul likely set that up. And now she's blessing so many people so powerfully. Makes it well worthwhile. Same way with uh, the the suffering that everyone goes through, whether we're aware of it at the time or not. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't trade in this time and this radio show and our conversation right now for anything. And it it took suffering seven years ago to get to where I am now, but I wouldn't trade it in with what I know and how powerful I live life and how many lives we're impacting. It's incredible. Um, so Mark, I don't know what you want to talk about next, but I want to make sure we find out more about the website, the Soul Phone Foundation, Soul Phone Foundation. I was on soulphone.org this morning and do oh boy, do you have a lot of resources, even finding out you were just spoken about in the, um, psychic news magazine on the cover of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, share about the foundation and the website if you could. Yeah, well, Gary and I um, had been in touch over the years. He was a guest on my radio show called Ask the Soul Doctors, uh, as with, as were people like Anita and uh, Carolyn Mace and others. And I sensed during our interview in the time before and after that, I had met a kindred spirit, someone who really ate, drank, and sleep, slept uh, all of this like I do. And so we kept in touch, and then we were both involved with Eternia, uh, the group merging science and spirituality started by John Audet and Evan Alexander. Mm-hmm. And Gary was the chairman and I was a VP. And uh, so then last um, September, I was going to be in Phoenix giving some workshops at the the wonderful Unity Church there. And um, just had a thought out of nowhere a week before we flew out. You ought to contact Gary and see if he wants to have lunch and, and see the lab. And my rational mind said, oh, you know, it's only a week out. He'll be too busy. But I listened right. to that that little inner voice, which I've learned to do. And Gary said, 
works out perfect. You know, we'll see the lab, we'll have lunch. So um, Andy, my fiance, that morning before we flew out to uh, Phoenix, we're in Ohio, said, Mark, he's going to ask you to work with him. And I was like, what? This is Gary Schwartz, you know, because in my mind, and I'm I'm not, you know, just uh, blowing smoke here. I've been around lots of people in my life, and I consider him to be one of the closest we have right now to Edison Einstein, that list I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got there. We had lunch. He starts asking me questions. What would it take to get you out here more? And, you know, how interested are you in, in this? And, and then he asked me. So that was last September. Uh, so <clears throat> we um, started working together as this unfolded, and he's, and then we quickly realized what we needed was a foundation, uh, partly for fundraising, although that's being taken care of magically on its own right now. Fantastic. Um, yeah, but secondarily for education, because uh, as you've uh, we've talked about a bit, it's going to take a while for people's heads to wrap around this. So we're just starting the conversation. So when it comes out, people aren't just overwhelmed and, and mind blown. Uh, so that's our primary role for the foundation. Now, education, we want to start community groups so people can get together in safe places because, uh, as I'm sure you've experienced, so many people have, quote, paranormal experiences. They they see, hear, experience things, and they think they're kooky. They think maybe they're going crazy. And oh, then yeah. you get a group of people together like, yeah, most of us are having that. Uh, so a place where we can share and then begin um, nurturing uh, the blessings that come from this. So, for example, working with, you, with each other on conscious language. So no criticism here, but in your introduction, you said, um, not only did I lose my dad, but my siblings. Okay, that word lose mm -hmm. can be upgraded. And that's part of what we encourage people to do is to use more conscious language. So those who have been listening uh, will notice I use all kinds of terms for, quote, dying, because dying is such an archaic term that conveys perhaps an end to existence, when in fact words like changing worlds, pass on, crossover, transition, mm -hmm. graduate, are, are much more indicative of what really goes on. It's the same way with like, you know, lose. Um, you know, that's, that's not such an accurate word. So it's not. Thank you for that, Mark. Thank you for that. Yeah. It helps me be more well, mindful. It's ingrained, in and that's one reason why I use quotes so much. So, for example, the other side, there's, you know, there's not another side. That's just a word we've used for so long. It's all life. There's just oneness, unity of mm -hmm. consciousness. And we've set up these uh, arbitrary words. You know, there's the here and the hereafter. There's here and then the other side. And, and they're really false. So that's part of what uh, Gary and Bob and I are working on is creating a, a glossary of terms, both for lay people and for scientists, so we can uh, work toward having a more commonly agreed upon language and make uh, headway that way as well. Oh, it's so good. I mean, I think of we have new words in language all the time, thinking of words like selfie, you know, <laughs> it's in the dictionary mm -hmm. now. We can definitely mm -hmm. change our terminology on um, the afterlife, the year after, whatever we you choose, however that works, but it, it's all possible. Yes. Uh, so that's what the foundation is working on then. And as you saw, there's so much on their videos, um, scientific reports. We have tried to um, share, for example, the four stages I mentioned. We draw parallels with current devices. So, for example, 50 years ago when I was a 10-year-old kid, we had a TV that only got three channels. Mm -hmm. And to get all three channels, my dad would have to climb up on a ladder on our two-story roof and physically move the antenna. And I'd stick my head out the window and say, yeah, okay, that's it. Stop. You know, <laughs> and, and people who didn't live back then don't realize. And now 50 years ago, you know, what, what's available, 14 million channels. And, you know, you just get it effortlessly. Well, the same way with uh, the cell phone communication devices. If you look at uh, the status of technology 50 years ago, uh, and then where we are now with cell phones and smartphones and so on, that seems impossible. Well, the, the soul phone occurring really isn't such a big leap when you look at that. 
Oh. By the way, I I just want to mention before we forget, we we're talking about the symposium in mm-hmm. Scottsdale this coming September. It's going to be such a wonderful assemblage of people and teachers. So I'll be giving uh, three different presentations there. The first is called Facilitated After Death Contact. Uh, so this is under hypnosis to allow people to experience the presence of their uh, quote, departed loved ones who are really very near, mm-hmm. you know, the consciousness is non-local so they can be right beside uh, the participants. So uh, we've had lots of meaningful experiences with these, and I just want to share one quickly. The uh, A year ago, I spoke to a, a bereaved parents group in Tampa uh, helping parents heal, and there's a mother there named Elaine, whose only child, her son, had passed on about four months before, and she was just beside herself, shaky and just um, so overwrought, like you see recently, the part, uh, deceased parents. Mm-hmm. Well, she heard all my information. She got my book, Soul Proof, and about five months later, she sent me an email with her sitting on a relatively recent grave smiling and she said i just want you to know this is the one year anniversary of my son's passing thanks to you i know that what lays underground is not him he's with me always he's everywhere Beautiful. and so then i saw her a couple months ago when uh, suzanne geesman and i did a, a workshop in saint pete and uh elaine had brought with her a couple other brief parents she was sitting in the front row so we did this facilitated after death contact session uh, so um, she went very deeply. You know, you can see a person's face is just putty. And mm-hmm. but about halfway through her, because I keep an eye on people to make sure everybody's doing OK. There's about 35 parents there. Halfway through uh, one side of her upper lip would raise and then the other side and then both. But the rest of her face was still totally relaxed and Mm -hmm. if you try in front of a mirror it's impossible to do so afterwards uh, people have a chance to share and she did share she said my son came in immediately we had a wonderful visit together she said and about halfway through he started manipulating my muscles to raise my lip so I could remember how to smile again oh yeah wow (laughs) I like that one (laughs) so uh the the facilitated after death contact sessions are, are wonderful. Uh, the next will be what I call pre birth planning, mm-hmm. and the uh, subtitle for that is "Did my soul really choose all this?" Again, under deep relaxation slap slash hypnosis to allow people the chance to revisit the time of planning before their soul came to Earth. Recall what it looked like, who was with them, their angels, guides, soulmates, and so on what the intent was, why perhaps they chose the likelihood, because everything isn't totally pre-planned, otherwise it'd be determinism and why bother with the experience. But at least the likelihoods, the probabilities for certain events, some of which are not so much fun from an earthly perspective, but all of which are uh, very potentially um, wonderful for growth and service opportunities. So pre-birth planning. And then the last thing will be called the angel wash. Uh, which is a wonderful experience. It allows us to duplicate the healing shower and the reunion that we have when we pass over. And so it's like an, a healing gauntlet. We'll do uh, groups of 60 uh, so that there's two lines of people. Or there's a line of people, uh, and then one person at a time walks through very slowly with the eyes closed, and people on either side then Uh, touch them, hug them, whisper something in their ear, send energy, whatever. And with this wonderful music in the background, how can anyone ever tell you anything less than beautiful? And it takes about uh, 10 minutes to go through this. Um, And at the end of that, a person usually has a much uh, better remembrance of who they are, why they're here, who walks beside them always. Oh, Mark, that's fantastic. I just got tears in my eyes when you talked about the pre-birth planning because I got this image of my dad and my siblings and it's like, okay, let's let's sign up for this task. You know, it's you know, it's going to be a big one. It's going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of pain, but we said, yeah, let's do it. We can do it together. It'll all work out 
you know, we're going to impact so many lives. And I just, just by having this conversation right now, got a little bit different view, you know, so thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. <sighs> and that, that's important for people to realize that it's all about love. The yeah. uh, contrast souls are so important for us. Uh, they're the ones who can push our buttons. So, for example, you, uh, for you, your siblings, out of love, you all are, are, are no doubt soulmates, and we usually have 25 or 30 primary ones and a larger number of secondary and tertiary ones. But they agreed out of love to have this estrange, this period of estrangement because they knew that would, just as you said, force you to seek uh, sensible answers. It would give you more time and space to reach all the many people you have, and you're just getting warmed up. And knowing that this time on earth is but a blink of an eye, and yes. it would re- result in so many blessings. So they're willing to do that. You know, there is probably tough on them also with their human heart. Sure. Um, but it's all worthwhile, and it's all very imaginary, really. Yeah, and all that's really present is love. You know, I I got a fortune cookie once that said the best place to stand in an argument is on the other person's side. And I always remember that because anytime there's any friction, any time in life, you know, if you can really step into another person's shoes and get it from their point of view, you know, you can get it and, and problems fade away. So all that's present with me and them, even though there is the... And the space between us uh, is love. It truly is. So um, how about this guy, Gary Schwartz? Would we get to meet him at this symposium? He will be there. He's, uh, he's <laughs> delivering the keynote and uh, will be presenting uh, information about how to scientifically validate spiritual topics. And uh, the hope is that more people in the field of spirituality will be able to mm, – uh, apply scientific principles, perhaps be a little more cautious about their statements because, you know, we don't want – there is a uh, there's a saying of a famous professor that Gary follows. He says, um, reach, reach for the stars with your intentions, with your goals, but understate your, your findings. And so uh, as we do reach the masses and the masses are ready for this, we want to be careful to not uh, – well, this way, we be careful to watch what we say, not get too woo woo, and to stick to what we have proof for as much as possible. Yeah, I love that. I I know in the beginning of my journey, even kind of coming out to people saying I want to write a book called "We Don't Die," I was petrified. And even now, there's been some radio shows that I've been on that are not coming from the like, let's find out what this girl knows, but instead, let's try to prove her wrong. So yeah. it's it's a scary world. And um I mean, it is and it isn't. When we start talking about it, I'm, I'm sure you found this too. There's a, mo- a lot of like-minded people that are really interested, but eh, we might not have been open about it because we don't know what other people think. And nobody wants others to think we're weird or strange. But I do believe that this soul phone is just another great credible piece and even the symposium i i invite you know i've been inviting mark <laughs> all the listeners on every show to go to afterlifestudies.org and come because this is it's more than just you know a few people out there that might be a medium able to connect you with your loved ones i mean there's so much real science and and truth and things happening that you have no idea that will give you that foundation you know besides just believing in the afterlife you'll have this knowing you know mm-hmm. and what a great way to live life so if if you're on the fence about coming to meet mark and i in september just do it <laughs> right yeah just do picking it. up uh, what you said about the skepticism i think really that people are afraid that it's too good to be true mm-hmm. i don't know about you but i remember vividly the day i found out there's no santa claus Mm -hmm. and to a lesser degree the easter bunny and the tooth fairy uh and i think some people have a sense that maybe uh, the idea of a a loving supporting god and we're all part of that and and that life is eternal and so is love we see our quote departed loved ones again i think people are afraid to hope and and be disappointed and that's one of the uh the catchphrases gary and i are developing for this you can believe now oh. because the, ev- the evidence is there. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. 
what else do you want to share, Mark, before we complete this? What haven't I asked you? What am I forgetting? <laughs> what's mm-hmm. what's in there to share? Yeah. Well, first of all, the um, I'd like to mention my my own website, yes. Soul, soulproof.com, mm-hmm. uh, because there's such a wealth of information there, free, much of it. Um, I've written 29 different articles that address all of the the biggest needs that people have when a, when your child dies, when a loved one dies by suicide, for people who are sensitive and empathic about after-death contacts, how to fine-tune your body, especially when you've been thrown out of balance by a, a big uh, emotional shock and so on. So what we call these foundational articles for healing and transforming. Uh, also free on the website at the top under the tab radio shows are about 22 shows I've had over the years uh, with Wayne Dyer, Brian Weiss, Raymond Moody, and I named the different names, the, the top names in consciousness studies. And we talk in each one about these very questions that people invariably ask when times get tough. Who am I? Why am I here? Is there a God? If so, why is there so much suffering? How can I... Um, how can I heal and how can I make the world a better place and so on? How can I deeply internalize this great news? So I encourage people to visit that, again, soulproof.com uh, to get that information. And that's part of the reason, by the way, why uh, Dr. Schwartz wanted to work with me because he knew that I had spent, well, as of next month, 45 years putting all this together wow, to, to help people. Yeah. Who, and so there's this wealth of evidence and that's part of the, the foundation to support the research. In other words, no sense doing research to contact people who have died unless we know that they are alive and well. So next thing I like to share is that for, for people who are going any kind of going through any type of uh, struggle and difficulty and let's face it, we all do. Um, that there's a reason for it. There's a meaning. It's not chaotic. It's not random. It's not bad luck. Uh, God is not asleep at the wheel. Uh, even though we may not be able to see the whole big picture now, and here's one, here's an analogy for helping us understand how very little of life we see. Um, if, well, the human sense is wonderful as they are, only detect such a small percent of reality. And so one model, and this comes from Lynn McTaggart in her book, The Field. She said, if all that exists in our world, and she's referring to light and energy, and this, by the way, this metaphor comes from the top quantum physics uh, physicists whom she uh, interviewed. Uh, she said, if all the light and energy that exists in our world were the size of Mount Everest, the portion the average human can perceive would be the size of a golf ball. So it's as though we're all walking around looking through this little tiny pinhole, mm-hmm. and then we wonder why life doesn't make sense or why you know things don't seem fair. So if we can open that, uh, our doors of perception, as Alex Huxley called her, or the third eye, the spiritual eye, we can open that just a little, maybe even a half dollar size, then we can see more of the big picture and like, Ah, you know, like the the uh, Oriental, ah, so, so it is, now I see. And that's what's called seeing the light, being saved, um, awakening, and so on. And so some ways to do that are meditation, of course, prayer, time in nature, so powerful. These are called centering practices. Uh, I led a group of uh, 20 women in this uh what they call it, soul awakening group by webinar Monday night and and shared with them uh, my holistic breathing technique. And so I have all these different uh, products. I mentioned the pre-birth planning facilitate after death contact. Well, the holistic breathing is another and they're available for $10 on a digital download or 15 for a CD. So I'm basically giving them away mm-hmm. so people can afford to get these tools. But this breath work is another way to deeply remember the big picture and see more of all that is. And then that's when things make so, so much sense. And it's interesting in these sessions we have with, with breath work, and I've led thousands of people through this, people usually start off crying 
just crying their heart and soul out, and that's releasing the, the pain and sadness. But then usually at some point, after about 20 minutes, they start laughing, <laughs> and laughing hysterically, you know, a, a belly laugh. And uh, that supports what the uh, the French philosopher Pascal said, that God is like a comedian playing to an audience that's too afraid to laugh. Mm. And so when we remember that it's all God, you know, life is forever. This is really kind of like a virtual reality experience we're having. You know, most of our soul's energy is back home or in other dimensions experiencing simultaneous realities. Just a very small part of who we are is, is in this time and place. And it's really an optical delusion, as Albert Einstein said. When we, and, and our real self cannot be hurt. We don't lose. We can't lose any loved ones, you know, because we're, we're so uh, connected forever. When we remember and see all that, that's when we just start laughing at all that we put ourselves through. Uh, so those are some of the um, strategies that I encourage people to use so they can lighten their life, so they can enjoy the journey. It's, uh, you know, Helen Keller said, life is either a daring adventure or is nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And it's true. So I think that's one reason we like uh, movies and plays and books with heroes and heroines who face great uh, opposition and then have a breakthrough because as Joseph Campbell so wonderfully taught, that's what we're doing here on earth. We each are heroes and heroines who as souls agree to come to this densest and darkest of places. Now, if we can remember who we are here and if we can let our light shine here and love one another, that so much raises our, our consciousness, our spiritual strength that we carry with us then through eternity. Oh, Mark, thank you so much. I am excited now just as an attendee to go to the symposium and and be in your audience and hear more from you. This has really been spectacular. Well, thank you. It's an honor to share it. Oh, I well, One last quick question. Will our loved ones have to learn from their side that are in the hereafter um, how to use the soul phone? Or, or mm. in the reason I ask that is, well, one bigger picture uh, to get the context is so many people have not gotten uh, messages from their loved ones. We've had some guests on and, you know, about receiving signs from your loved ones and things like that. And, you know, it's my instinct that people have to learn how to do the communication from where they're at. And mm -hmm. it's not something that we're all so wise and know how to do it. Yeah, it's a great question. And that's why in the beginning, as I mentioned, we'll have a uh, technical assistant to handle all the technology. We'll have one of the top mediums who will contact then a sole operator. So, for example, Susie Smith and others who have been on the other side who are very great evolved souls while on Earth will serve as like an operator. And you're just like the old phones that had an operator and operated the switchboard. So, uh, let's say, for example, the you want to make an appointment and contact your dad. So you call, make an appointment, the medium contacts the soul operator and says, can you find your dad's John, did you say? Yes. Yeah. So we want to find John Champlain. And because, you know, who knows where he is in, in the cosmos, but he gets the message. Are you available at this time? Are you comfortable work with working with the technology? And if not, acquaint him with that or the soul operator can even uh, help, uh, quote, on the other side with the technology and then establish that connection. It's a far-sighted question. I can see you've been thinking about this. Yeah. Oh, I, I just have a big smile on my face and I just can't help but think back to those poor Wright brothers in the beginning when people heard what they were up to and thought these guys are crazy. But like, look mm -hmm. what's available now. Well, Mark, thank you for being our guest today. Really. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for what you. you're doing. Ooh, this is a good one. This is in my top 10 episodes right now. And this is, of course, episode 151. Hard to believe. I want to remind you, our listener, that you can visit Mark on his own website, which is soulproof.com. You can hear those, um, those episodes from Ask the Soul Doctors and get so much more, uh, more things at his website. And also, I, 
tell you, go to soulphone.org, check out the website, become a member of the foundation if you like, uh, and really take some time to learn what's happening. There's so much more than we've even covered on this hour this hour interview and I'm going to say it once again please come meet us in September it'll be so much fun and you'll meet a whole group there's probably going to be about 500 people there of like-minded people you're going to meet some friends that you'll have for the rest of your life for probably eternity so go to afterlifestudies.org to register and there's a few days left in getting a, a early special pricing for that although it's reasonable even if you've missed that window I do want to request that if this episode made a difference for you, share it, share it, share it. You have no idea who in your life is grieving the loss of a beloved one or could use some inspiration or to find out something like the soul phone. So be courageous. It's a good growth for the soul today to do that. And also, you feel free to go to wedontdieradio.com and visit all the past episodes. If you listen on YouTube, you can comment, which is always a lot of fun. And last, you know, just in the words Mark shared uh, at the beginning of this episode and the end, we are forever beings and you can believe now. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I've been your host, and I do believe that life is an education for the soul, and that your life here on Earth is important. So make it a great day. I thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.